Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this session. And before that, I should say uh, welcome to the conference. And on behalf of the people organizing this conference and uh, the people who are going to contribute in this session, uh, you are welcome uh, to uh, this session. And I hope you know you will get benefit of what we are going to talk about. <coughs> uh, optometry is an autonomous uh, profession. Uh, we're sharing everything with everybody who are interested in eye health care. So uh, from my team today, uh, Katie, Aunt, Ram, and Dash, and uh, Zulfagar, we are going to present uh, 10 minutes for each uh, person, and I hope you know you will get benefit of that. Uh, and then uh, the microphone is for Aunt. Uh, she is an orthoptist coming from uh, Tunisia. She is the president of the uh, Association of Orthoptics in uh, Tunisia. Uh, with her experience, uh, today, she is going to uh, talk to us about some orthoptic topic. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Dr. Geller. No problem. I thank all uh, team for uh, this opportunity. So my uh, presentation will uh, be about orthoptic management of diplopia. Uh, diplopia is the double vision when two images are separated. It could be, it can be vertically, horizontally, or both, obliquely. So whether Diplopia is disappeared or persist after closing one eye. It, it, could, it can be binocular or monocular. If it disappears after closing eye, one eye, it's a, diplop, a binocular diplopia. It's uh, when uh, the eyes lose their simultaneous alignment with the object regard in one or more distant, distant di direction or gaze when uh, we have anomalies, position head, vision barely vesti vestibular signs, nystagmus presence of partial ptosis. The important part of the management is observation and inspection. Obser observation, we will take up head tile, ptosis, the difference of size puppy, proptosis, spontaneous eye movement. The head posture is when weak extraocular muscle, muscle cannot move the fully. The patient, patients compensated by tightly or turning the head in the direction of the weak muscle. The evolution by its uh, begin by the history taking. A daylight in history of diopia has a very important role in establishing the diagnosis. The assessment must include the honest quality, direction, concomitancy, variability or, or fragility, associated symptom or disease, uh, visual acuity, studying of version, version, convergence, diction, ocular alignment, and pupils. Evaluation by studying saccade and pursuit, the pursuit <coughs> by induction and version. Uh, here we see the movement of eyes. We have uh, limited of the abduction of the right eye. Orthoptic eye examination uh, by Maddox Road, Red Glass has screen testing, Hashberg test, Krimsky test, monocular cover and cover test, alternative cover test, and simultaneous prismas and cover test. 
here the red left the test, uh, the patient will tell us where is uh, the distance is more than in, uh, when in each uh, gaze. So, so we, we put the red glass. Uh, uh, ocular, uh, we will study the ocular alignment, uh, then the cover test and a cover test to see if there is if we have phoria or tropia, the treatment, the, it, uh, the objective is to create the largest and most central area of single binocular vision. Occasionally, patients may choose at, to adapt a head title to, use, to utilize both eyes and eliminate uh, diplopia. Oclu uh, the first uh, the systematic uh, treatment uh, that we begin with is occlusion of one eye remains the easiest, it's the easiest and most conversated treatment of binocular, binocular treatment. It, uh, uh, by using a pirate patch, frosting and eyeglasses lens, placing scotch uh, satin tapes. Scotch tapes, satin tape, are the low cost, reasonable appearance, and ability to patch only portion of the lens where diplopia occurred. Like the big change. It, um, the, content, uh, the content lenses are more cost, uh, costly than scotch satin. The Bengeter occlusion follows to, that adhere to the glass or hyperopic overcorrection to introduce monocular blur. Patient with a, patients with a failure committant deviation may prefer prismatic correction. Fernal prisms range from 1 to 14 prisms, prism dioptry. Grounding prisms are significantly more expensive and are limited to 10 to 12 dioptry per lens because of cosmetic appearance and the weight of the lens. Patient, patients with long standing, sta if we have established strabismus for more than 6 to 12 uh, months, it considers as a, uh, as a strabismus surgery. We talked about binocular vision. Now, if, uh, if a diplopia persists after closing one eye, so it's a, mono, it's a monocular diplopia, it's uh, the, most part of, uh, the most part of patients have defect refractor, irregular astigmatic subluxed, subluxed uh, clear lenses, early cataract, large iridotomy, macula disorder. <coughs> and then we, we discussed some cases. The first case, uh, 64, 65 years old, Parkinson's disease. He had uh, intermittent, intermittent, intermittent diplopia and had a headache. The visual acuity is 10, 10 for the right, 6, 10 for 10 uh, the left. On the cover test, covering cover test, we have in exophorotropia 18, uh, in near in distance uh, exophorotropia for uh, 14. Uh, stereoscopic vision, Tiano, 120 second arc. So versions, we measure versions. Uh, conversions uh, are uh, are weak both near and distance, Diver divergence, we have, uh, it's better than uh, convergence. So for Mr. Fathi, we, the first step that we will do is uh, orthoptic therapy, vision therapy. After six months of uh, vision therapy, we, we remark that we have uh, the convergence at better than the at the beginning, but uh, it, it, but diplopia persists. So we do the Lancaster test. 
we have and we give them the prism glasses, five job trees, temporal base for each eye. And this is after prismation and the polyopia disappears. And we continue with therapy vision. The conclusion for this case, horizontal diplopia that appear only after a plan, uh, of the, only after a plunge, a prolonged near vision is highly pointing towards convergence and sufficiency, most common in patient, patient with Parkinson's disease. Second case, diplopia since uh, eight months, on the covering cover test, we found 25 dioptries in a year, and the far isophoriate, oh, sorry, uh, isophoriatropia 60. Uh, when we studied the versions, we found the overaction of the right medial. This is the. One, one minute. One minute. <laughs> I finished. Uh, this is uh, without prism, so we prism with uh, a prism 16 uh, ba temporal base. Up is uh, the, the Lancaster with uh, prism. And the last one, Adam, six years old, to this left eye, limited upward gaze, floor fracture with muscle incarceration. This motility, we have palsy of elevation, palsy of low wearing, the Lancaster. And what we'll do, the emergency is the surgery to release the incarcerated muscle. After, a month after surgery, this is motility and versions. Diplopia persists in the downward gaze, so we, mm -hmm. we do the scotch certain tapes to eliminate uh, and uh, diplopia. In conclusion, the case of ocular misalign misalignment for binocular diplopia must be ter de determined and life treatment condition must imply an immediate, an immediate management. Management and treatment is always according to the specific cause of diplopia. It can be occlusion eye, duction exercise, prismation, botox, or surgery. The goal of the orthoptic management of diplopia is to, to create the large and the most central area of the single, single binocular vision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you and, uh, for this uh, great presentation. And I hope once we will have like workshop, yeah, with uh, hands-on if possible. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now I'm uh, asking Kate. Yeah, she is an optometrist uh, working in Morfield Hospital, Dubai. Uh, floor is yours, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. So, yes, I'm an uh, optometrist at Moorefields, mostly specializing in pediatrics. And this morning, I'm going to try to topple what you know about pediatrics on its head. Uh, pediatric refraction pearls, not to be confused with the perils of pediatric refraction, okay? It's not as bad as you think. So, a couple of pointers. The initial meeting, um, I firmly believe in building your rapport with the child before the parent, okay? You need to rely on the child to give you the responses they can give you, you know, um, I will always, in, when they come into the room, I'll ask them, what's your name? I know fine well what their name is. Who's this lady you've brought with you? Is this mom? I really like your shoes. Anything to get these kids on your side is going to help you in what you need to find, okay? I would always open, give open and close questions. So are you having problems with your eyes? What are those problems? And then kind of hone in. So is it when you're seeing the board at school? Is it watching the TV? Is it the iPad that gives you headaches? And then I'd confirm those details with the parents. Is that, is that what you think as well? 
Um, and differentially diagnosed from the offset, you know, your history and symptoms is by far your greatest tool when you're doing any refraction, be it a child or an adult, okay? So patient management, not all children need to be cycloed. Not every four-year-old needs to be cycloed, not every six-year-old. I'm gonna give you some uh, case histories, just ones that I come across a lot and see what you think. Be reasonable in your approach. Again, don't have a, a, blanket, a blanket management plan for all children. Uh, and do your symptoms and your results match up. If you have a child that's complaining, I can't see the board in school, but their prescription is plus 0 0.5 spheres, nothing else, that doesn't really make sense. So make sure everything makes sense at the end. So here are some patient files. So this is Alex and he's age four. It's his first visit and mum thinks the left eye is turning in. On occasion, not constant. The vision seems okay, TV and iPad are fine, the general health is good and birth is normal. Dad was myopic pre-LASIK. Vision, we've used K pictures. So right eye 0 0.1, left 0 0.14, binocular is very good. And the note, shy, take some encouragement, maybe not interested. I'm lucky enough to have uh, an orthoptic team alongside me in Moorfield. Uh, so unaided, uh, in the near, minimum X, good recovery, so exophoria, and in the distance, no abnormality detected. Frisbee test, 55 seconds of arc, great motility, is normal convergences to nose, and we got an A or result on this child as such. I wouldn't cyclo them. I don't know how anyone else would feel, but if this is the child's first visit, results so far, pretty normal so this is quite common I would open this up for discussion with the parents and I would say look you think the left eye is turning in it's not the vision in the left eye may be a little bit weaker but it's also their first time here they're shy they're nervous um, you know orthoptically sound no problems so and now I'm talking about cyclo as well not dilation first time visit I understand if you want to dilate people for fundus and media checks but in terms of cycloplegia I would very much leave this one to the parents and say, I'm happy to see you again in six months. And if there's still that bit of an ISO between the two eyes, then we can look at cyclo. Because it's a child's first time. You really don't want to terrify these children in the beginning, okay? A second patient, Michelle, six, first visit, the teacher recommends because they're struggling to see the board in school. So skipping down to their visions, I'm using Logmar here, 0 0.42, 0 0.36, and pinhole as such. Orthoptic assessment is fine and normal. These big AORs, minus four and minus 350, are we cycloing them? Probably, but I wouldn't cyclo them just yet. Let's not be afraid to try a subjective on a six-year-old. And I'm gonna tell you how I do a subjective on a six-year-old, okay? We have a retinoscope in our clinic and we are very efficient at using it. Don't be afraid to use it, pick it up, have a look. You know if their vision is 0 0.4, 0 0.3, you're thinking about a minus one prescription, something like that potentially, okay? So I would do a dry ret. This is the results and I'd check their vision. I would do a plus one blur. I don't think we utilize a plus one blur enough either. Plus one blur should push you back three lines, which it has done in the right eye, left eye not quite there, but if we give a little bit more plus, then it does, okay? So let's adjust the prescription a little bit. I hope you can follow that. And then fine tune the sill and axes. So you show them your circles. Uh, does it look rounder and clearer with one or two? Forget about it. Children are not going to know what you're talking about. But just ask them, show them the letters or the pictures, what you're using and say, does it look better with number one or number two? And they'll really, they're quite good at giving you response. Children are much more decisive than adults. That is a fact, okay? And then yes, I would probably cyclo them to make sure everything is okay. I do agree with cycloing and certainly because they're myopic, a family history of myopia, you want the dilation there as well for fundus and media checks. This one, patients uh, nor seven, this is her 12 month or 12 year check or 12 year, one year check of 12 months. Uh, she's overdue a little bit. A management of an ET, she's wearing her glasses full time and dad doesn't think there's any problems, her general health and everything is okay, but maternal aunt had a lazy eye. So in her glasses, she's wearing plus five on the right, plus three, seven, five on the left. Vision is all right. Her lenses are scratched though and the coating is breaking down. It's been 12 months. So orthoptically, everything is stable. 
through her squint is well controlled, her vision is quite good with glasses, are we cycling this patient? I hope everyone says no. This is one of the patients you really don't need to cyclo. Giving her any more plus is not going to help anything. She sees well, her squint is well controlled. There's no need to give her more plus. You could do a dry ret. I mean, her AOR is dropped down because yes, she's accommodating. But you know she doesn't, you, you don't want to drop down to this plus. I would just over refract her on her glasses. Pick up a dry ret, have a look, but over refract on the glasses. Max. Max is everyone's favorite patient in an optometry clinic. So Max's first eye test, because he can't see the board at school, his last eye test was three years ago and there was no problems. Vision, right eye is such, and the left eye, and binocularly it happens to be not as good as his right eye. So already you're thinking, binocularly you should at least be the better vision, if not better. Cover test was uh, pretty much normal, nothing going on orthoptically, and his AOR is so we're probably thinking Max is a malingerer, okay? Especially if he had an eye test three years ago and there was no problem. Are we cycloing him? Probably, but I strongly recommend you try to prove malingering before you cyclo. And the reason being is I've had the conversation with the parent where you've jumped to cyclo, you said they don't need glasses, and they say, well, why can't, why can't he see the board in school? Your child's a liar. <laughs> No, not a great conversation to have. So I would try some tests. Neutralization, if anyone doesn't know, stick in a plus six. Can you see? No. Put in a minus six on top. Ah, yeah, I can see. You'll get them down loads, okay? Plano test. You know, pick up your ret, fiddle around the frupter, beep, 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 zero, zero, check their vision. Stereo. Stereo is a super important tool. You, if their vision is that bad, they really shouldn't have any stereopsis, okay? And color vision is quite a clever one. Sit back from them with their color vision chart. Can you read the numbers? Tell me what the numbers are. If they're reading that, you know, when you're kind of a meter, two meters back, they're probably lying about their eyesight. Threaten eye drops is a personal favorite of mine. Um, if you can't see this, we're gonna to have to use those eye drops, you know, the ones you don't like. And sometimes that's enough to uh, get the vision moving. And the very last patient I want to touch on, hopefully I'm okay for time, okay. So, all I want to show you with this one is the visions and the AOR, okay? So you might think those astigmatism is what's causing the problem with that vision, okay? And you might just jump into giving them glasses for astigmatism. Occasional headaches noted. Without the orthoptic assessment, you are going to have missed this esophoria at near, okay? This occasional headaches you could have tied up to being a little bit astigmatic, but in fact, it's this esophoria at near. So that is one patient that needs to be dilated. And with that to finish, your non-negotiables and pediatrics should be your visions and pinhole if you can, cover test, stereo, and a plus one blur. Chalas, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Great, great, great. <laughs> Great, Katie. Uh, to be honest, uh, dealing with kids is, uh, you know, it's a little bit difficult, you know, in the clinic, especially with the school and uh, malingering, and you know, they have got a lot of things to do at home with their uh, parents, and that's reflected in the school. Therefore, I would say all the optometrists they're supposed to be very vigilant on this and to try the different things that. Katie has uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. Excellent uh, presentation. Uh, really, we take on board what you have said. Uh, the next person is going to talk about, uh, to update us about uh, myopia treatment, and that will be Zulfigar, assistant professor at University of Bremi, and uh, he's interested in uh, the uh, correction of myopia. Okay, the floor is yours, Zulfiqar. Okay, and you have got 10 minutes here. It, it we'll see you then. Hello, everybody. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayom, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Jalal. Uh, today, I will share with you some information about, about uh, myopia management. 
because uh, myopia be not like a refractive errors as before. Myopia now increased like uh, uh, geometric consequence, not number numbering consequence. And let's see. I will address this topic uh, within this point, introductions and prevalence of myopia in different regions, include Middle East, and myopia in COVID-19, and etiology of myopia and management of myopia. Uh, myopia, as we know, is the commonest refractive errors if compared with, refractive, uh, with other refractive errors like stigmatism and hypermetropia but it is the commonest one uh, begin in the first years of life and remains one of the common cause of uh, visual environment according to the uh, different studies in different regions. Uh, if we look for these uh, four uh, studies, globally you can find myopia is uh, 28.3 in the last uh, estimation. And if we look for Chinese and uh, Saudi Arabia, in the last studies, you can find the number near to 50. And studies or suspicion or expectation of myopia to be 50% in 2050. But now, in some studies speak about China and Saudi Arabia, near to 50%. In uh, Kazakhstan, around near to the uh, worldwide uh, estimation. During, uh, during COVID-19, there is more progression of uh, myopia according to studies, which is done 2020, 22, in China increased during COVID-19 pandemic, but I, uh, according to this study, due to uh, home-based learning, because uh, uh, ch children, they stay more time uh, indoor. Uh, this uh, study done in, uh, or uh, to, expectation for myopia, they said by 2050, should reach around 50%. But now you can find some studies speak out about now the number near to 50% are more than 30%. This according to Brian Holder, Vision Institute. Uh, the effect of said, if you need to calculate the myopia, if you start by minus one in the first year of life, if increased by minus one yearly, the patient will reach big number of myopia. For that, now they're speaking not about how to correct myopia. It's an easy way to correct patient with myopia, minus two or minus three. But now the headache, the myopia increased uh, yearly. I need to stop this progression. Uh, redu reducing or uh, reduction of progression uh, by 50% could reduce uh, the prevalence and will reduce uh, up to 90%. The etiology of myopia, we, as we know, there is two uh, etio main etiology, environmental etiology, as appeared, and uh, genetic uh, factors. The risk factor of myopia include the reduction of outdoor activities, as in this time, because there is less of outdoor activities, and more, our, uh, more time of children is uh, indoor and in front of tap. Uh, and also excessive near work, school work, or maybe uh, playing work. Therefore, the management of myopia should concentrate mostly in these factors, these two factors. The management of myopia becomes global public health burden because as we know, myopia like pandemic now, okay? Not like uh, refractive errors as before. There are two uh, type or main type of uh, treatment. The first one is wearing glasses. The wearing glasses will be or contact lenses, bifocal or uh, progressive uh, to reduce hypermetropic defocus because the progression of myopia is uh, by elongation of anterior posterior diameter of the eye. Here we need to reduce that. Another thing is atropine eye drops with different concentrates from 0.05, maybe now we speak about 0.5, uh, 0.5 eye drops to reduce progression of myopia. The, there is different uh, protocol for that, but the known protocol 
uh, daily for uh, three to two to three months, and then after that weekly, okay, to reduce the progression of myopia. Uh, outdoor activity is very important, and the result now is speak about the outdoor is effective more than these other uh, management procedures. The purpose of myopia management is to, firstly, we need to delay the elongation, which is uh, happened by hypermetropic defocus, and to minimize the spectacle Rx, because if the myopia progress, that means the, the child need to change the glass, maybe not yearly, less than that. For that, we need to reduce the Rx and reduce the risk of retinal change, which is happen by the progressive myopia. Uh, the time spent outdoor has been shown have modest effect of reducing myopia, and most of the studies speak about uh, reduction of progression by outdoor activities. This uh, photo of my kid. And the prevention should be concentrate to reduction of near activities. All, the, uh, all these things should be concentrated on these things. For that now, the, the most practitioner gives the children uh, activity outside or outdoor and reduce the activity indoor to reduce progression of myopia because the headache not the uh, number of people who has myopia now. The headache, the myopia increased more. Uh, the on a study in, uh, this conducted in, uh, conducted in China for six years old children in uh, Gonzalo, China, the addition of 40 minutes of outdoors activity or school compared with the usual activity that re reduced the incidence of myopia and will be in the, or reduced in the next three years, okay? That means reduce the progression, and reduce the incidence. A number of studies have reported lower levels of serum vitamin D. Now also, another thing, the reduction of vitamin D will lead also to uh, increase or progress of myopia. For that, we need to give or supplement vitamin D or be or st uh, outdoor in the sun or exposed to the sun will reduce progression progression of myopia. Uh, combination with two, so sometimes some patient with high number of myopia or high powers, we need to uh, combine it between two types, like use novel contact lens with atropine or use contact lens with outdoor uh, times and also keratology, but also keratology, the result is not good because uh, the patient will draw back another time and if we stop, if we stop using orthokeratology, orthokeratology lens. Uh, axial myopia is important metric to monitor patient. If you need to look for your patient uh, and to monitor the patient, it's very important for us to do a scan. A scan will show us if there is elongation of the eye globe or not. Uh, the long term of use of atropine uh, can be within your mind because atropine is very, very serious and dangerous. For that, not use atropine at all. Uh, this is a conclusion or some message we will take with you. Generally, the management of myopia should include uh, patient education because if the patient know how to do what he need to do, this will help you to explain your patients, an early checkup because you need to follow your patients, and a lifestyle for your patient, difficult to give information for someone, the lifestyle is low, it's very difficult to, to apply this type of uh, management. And initiation of treatment for decreasing progression of myopia, and this is very important point. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zulfagar. Yeah, that's true. Myopia is uh, a progressive uh, sort of uh, disease those days and past the immetrobization area or time. We need monitoring, we need screening, we need 
to share those patients with secondary and tertiary uh, uh, the uh, sectors and obvious uh, the uh, combination of all the output of all those or the input of all those will uh, going to control uh, myopia. Uh, uh, now I would uh, introduce uh, my friend Zach uh, from Morfield Hospital, Dubai. Yeah, to. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Talk about, I mean, you know, color of my eyes. I would like to change the color of my eyes. <laughs> I don't think the men will go for that, but we'll see. Oh, it would surprise you. This one's working. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, my name's Zach Cairns. I'm one of the specialist optometrists. For today's session, there's a lot of avenues to cover in terms of colored or cosmetic contact lenses. I find that probably the best way to approach this topic would be examples that I see in clinic on a daily basis. Now, when we're talking about colored contact lenses, uh, the history of it was actually quite interesting. It was uh, Ruben Greenspoon was an optometrist based out of California, and he made the first colored contact lens in 1939. And this was um, a glazed contact lens going, changing the color of the eye from brown to green, and it was used in the movie Miracles for Sale, three years after colored television came on air. And that's a photo of him beside Elvis Presley, one of the only photographs of him. The high street contact lenses, or more of the, um, you know, more of the, the lenses that you'll see on a day-to-day -day basis available, they do have lots of pros, so obviously they're quite fashionable at the minute, they're great for Halloween, you know, you can scare some friends, and um, it's something that definitely in this region is popular. Anyone that works in any type of clinic, be that hospital or um, high street, will um, be very aware that this is something that we need to offer. It does lose some depth of the eye, and that's naturally because the iris is behind the cornea, okay? It has that minification effect, and that's just not there with the cosmetic lenses. It is helped slightly by these enhancement tints that have came out. Now, you can see it on the uh, top right corner, where it lets some of the iris through, and essentially gives a, either a limbal band or a small overlay of color. Obviously, whenever we're talking about tints, you've got visibility or handling tints. And this is in many of the daily soft lenses that we use. An opaque tint, which is one that you can see at the bottom. This is more of the lenses that we'll use in the hospital and we'll discuss today. And then obviously, if we're talking about tints, we've got the uh, new, sort of new, AccuView transition lenses that's available on the market. The medically necessary contact lenses, so that's what we'll use mostly in the hospital. We primarily use two, um, either UltraVision or Cantor and Nissel, and I'll explain some of you know, the uses for this in the next slide. Now, I am an optometrist, I'm not an artist, but I've tried my best to demonstrate the uh, contours and the colors of the lenses in the top right corner. So this is what we call just a, basically a pupil lens. Essentially, it's a small, homogenous, or sort of uniform color used in the center. Now, this patient has a congenital cataract since birth, so there's no vision in the eye, but they, aren't, they want obviously something to cosmetically enhance the appearance. It's really important to measure the pupil in the other eye to make sure that you can match it well. When you're matching this pupil, okay, it's important to do it in direct light, okay? There look, nothing looks worse than when you've got a pupil that's far too big because when the person goes outside or they're having lunch or whatever and you've got a really big pupil, bigger is always more noticeable than small. So you really want to err on the side of caution with this. But they can either get a six monthly or an annual version and again, I'd say pretty good results. It still keeps that natural depth of the eye. The homogenous tint, if we go something bigger, so this is a uniform 30% LTF, or light transmittance factor, brown tint. This lady, um, I actually saw her for a follow-up. She's been wearing these lenses for years. Her case is ocular albinism. So she has a uniform brown tint. Most of her friends and family 
or a lot of friends at least, don't actually know the color of her eyes. She wears these from morning to night, and when she took the lens off at the start of the appointment, I nearly fell off my seat, okay, because she had these really striking blue eyes underneath. With the sort of retinal conditions like ocular albinism, they can either have a uniform um, neutral density gray, so which reduces all the colors or a brown. In the UK, people preferred brown because it gives them the illusion that it's summer all year round. Here, not so much. People tend to prefer the greys. We can have this sort of donut shaped, what we call in clinic, or this type C. Now, the patient's eye has had a peripheral iridotomy due to an anterior chamber IOL, which you can see. This was obviously causing a lot of glare while striving. All we need to do is a small bit of tint around the outside, cover up that patch, and the patient's really happy. They use it as and when they need to. And as I said, a lot of these lenses are either six months or annual lenses. So he can wear it just when he needs to drive. I hope that's not for me. I've got a few more. The type D then, this is where we've got the homogenous sort of light brown, gray or green tint and the pupil in the center. Now this patient had a chemical burn in one eye. <coughs> the eye was a bit unsightly. And obviously he just wanted something to go to work in that uh, people weren't looking at it. Brown eyes are obviously much easier than blue, gray, green, and the various colors in between. Um, with this, you can either have a homogenous tint, which is plain, or you can add a little bit of flair with an iris. The beauty of these printed irises are they are completely repeatable. So what you get for one patient is what you'll get in six months time when you order it. Essentially, all we ask for here is a uniform type D, so where you've got 40% brown at the back, specified pupils diameter, three, four, five millimeter, and then they've got a few different types of iris to choose from. This patient has metal sutures, if you can see, in the uh, top left corner from a pretty complicated cataract surgery. And uh, he wears the contact lens in that eye, it looks great. Nothing looks good under times 16 or times 25 magnification. So whenever we move on to these blue printed designs, again, this can be uh, replicated. You want to try your best to match the eye. And some of the results can be really, really good. It loses the depth of color, okay? But what you can gain is a pretty repeatable, a pretty good lens. It's also a lot cheaper to get something that's printed than something that's handmade. Now, when we're talking about either the sort of one-off handmade or the printed lenses, they come in a wide variety of, um, of colors, sizes, shapes, and prescription. So actually, I was chatting with Ram just yesterday about an aphakic patient who has aniridia. So this is someone that we can both give a prescription to and um, an iris, okay, to help with the glare and the vision. Now, the hand-painted lenses, they're truly amazing. What you do is you hold up the swatch that you can see here, best match it to the eye, and then the company, be it Cantor Initial or Ultra Vision, will hand paint and edit it, taking the reference point of their already known reference lens, be that S2, S3, whatever the color is. This is just a quick example. So this was from a car accident. Okay, this is the hand painted lens under a microscope. And as I said, bear with me, nothing looks great at this kind of magnification. You can see the individual brush strokes. A lot of these light gray blue eyes have a lot of pigment around the iris it, and in the periphery. So they're quite pale generally in the middle. Looks okay there, but once you put on a pair of glasses for him, you know it, he looks much more flattering and he's out on his dates. Glasses are your best friend when it comes to a cosmetic lens clinic. This patient, um, when he was a child, had barbed wire in the eye, this massive white scarring area along the cornea, and with a small bit of color in the eye and a pair of glasses, you would never know. This is a bullous keratopathy eye, so this is, has a grayish blue tint to it. All we done was give her a pupil, and she wears her normal glasses to work every day, her normal progressives. And you can see there, you can get some really, really fantastic results, and you don't need to overcomplicate a lot of these patients. This was probably one of the more interesting ones. So it was an 11-year-old boy that I saw, and he had a, a left birthmark in the sclera. Now, his friends, his family, 
you know, they were very well aware of this. They, you know, thought it was a nice little quirk. But the one time it annoyed him was birthday parties. When he was meeting new kids, he would get lots of questions, ask lots of, um, you know, why is that there? What's it doing? Vision was excellent in the eye. The next slide shows just the extent of the scleral birthmark. There was no uh, defects, no abnormalities of the eye other than this dark pigmentation. And it was quite striking. So the solution was a 22 millimeter soft lens. That was from Cantor and Nissel. Um, sort of regular base curve, large diameter, and plano. Essentially, this is 12 millimeters of clear lens, and then extended out into the periphery with a white contact lens with blood vessels painted over it. The patient just wears it for his birthday parties. And just quickly to finish up on, um, a lot of these companies can do specialist lenses, be that for Halloween, movies, whatever you need. And it's a great way to get patients into your practice if you can run a Halloween special and get them wearing proper lenses at Halloween so that on the 1st of November, you haven't got a lot of red eyes coming into your clinic. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Thank you very much. That's an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, to be honest, uh, uh, we know uh, contact lens, uh, especially the color contact lens is starting from uh, optional for cosmosis reasons. And then, you know, from optional up to where in the hospital after uh, surgery or deformity of the eyes. So uh, whatever the, uh, the, the, the reason behind that, okay, we take it easy from the uh, side of cosmosis and young people and according to their dressing or just i mean you know they would like to change the color of their iris to hide a uh, few deformities uh, in, happening in the eye uh, not intentionally definitely just i mean a matter of uh, treatment so we have to look at collegiality here if you are not specialized in doing this please do send those patients to the hospitals or the centers that uh, they do this, and that's for the benefit of the patient, and at the same time, uh, that will let us feel comfortable about our profession. And thank you very much, uh, Zach. Excellent presentation. And uh, you, you don't need to, <laughs> to do that. I'm okay with what I have got. Now I will introduce my uh, teacher, uh, Dr. Jalal Mohammed Ismail. He's uh, associate professor. University of Al Briami, Sultanate of Oman. Thank you very much, Dr. Zulfogar. Um, I'm going to touch uh, just, I mean, you know, the clinical approach to uh, low vision. And I feel, I mean, you know, we need to do some work on here. Again, I'm a person who would like, I mean, all the people to share whatever they have got from the uh, knowledge and skill uh, so as to benefit our patients. Okay. Uh, the objective uh, terminology is relevant to low vision, global prevalence, and causes of visual impairment. Clinical games help clinicians to um, uh, provide optimum treatment whenever that possible. Low vision uh, definition uh, of visual function that cannot be corrected by conventional glasses, contact lens, medical treatment, or surgery. And, uh, Obvious, you know, when we say something like this, uh, everybody will know that's, you know, low vision. But me presenting this for a purpose, because there is more than one uh, definition for low vision. That's, you know, WHO, and we have got, you know, the different countries, and the very important point on those definitions, there is hidden, uh, what, not saying hidden agenda, but I mean, you know, there is a purpose for the difference of the words in the, uh, the definition, because there is a financial impact on those definitions. In some countries, they do give benefits for those people who have got low vision. But I mean, where is the cut? Yeah, where is the cut that you know they to give those benefits? And uh, what are the categories? For that reason. I would prefer if I can give, I mean, you know, those uh, definition. As I said here, definition of low vision varies depending on the source, loosely based on visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, and visual field. Visual uh, acuity, we know words 
than uh, 20 over 60, and contrast sensitivity 25% uh, reduction, and or visual field 20 degrees, where some people they're saying 10. So which one uh, you consider in that particular country? That's you know, the idea, because now we are coming from different countries and different regulation and different uh, laws. <coughs> Low uh, vision terminology, visual function, and vi functional vision. Okay, uh, visual function denoted by visual acuity, visual field, binocular vision, contrast sensitivity, and color vision. Okay, where functional vision, person ability to use their vision to effectively accomplish uh, a task. That's, you know, an important point. If we would like to put this in context, okay, and to test it, we will say here, if I've got somebody who is age-related macular degeneration, decreases visual acuity to that extent, and then his age is 55 years old, accountant, okay, cannot read his uh, account uh, document at work. What's going to happen? He's going to lose his job. Who is responsible of that? Who is uh, doing the measurements? And who is signing th that consent, I mean, you know, to, sorry, the letter that will uh, allow this pay or let this person be out of job. Okay, this is a responsibility of us all together. That's the optometrist and the ophthalmologist because this will be signed by the ophthalmologist, I believe, in so many countries. Uh, cataract decreases visual acuity. Patient is 70 years old, retired. I wouldn't say this patient is not visually uh, handicapped or visually handicapped because, I mean, you know, surgery now for cataract is uh, you know, uh, can happen at any time, and uh, the person will be able to restore his vision if free from other uh, uh, problems. But in that sense, Mendoza, catching people who are in the middle age, I would say, they will be affected uh, uh, a lot. That's, you know, 35 years old, and you can see here, cannot drive to grocery store or cannot enjoy running anymore. This is another problem. So we need, I mean, to address it as low vision people. Then we come to the classification. As we can see here, we have got uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and that's, you know, will take us uh, uh, to the uh, amount of visual acuity uh, to match each of those categories. And here, this is for the WHO definition, and obvious anybody can achieve that or get that. The message I would like to send here, visual acuity is to be tested with both eyes open. That will even psychologically help the patient to accept the situation. Uh, causes of low vision, we know. We categorize them as new needs. That is due to retinopathy prematurity. Uh, retinoplastoma, congenital glaucoma, congenital cataract, albinism. In childhood, we can see uh, cone dystrophy, optic atrophy, retinitis pigmentosa, staggered disease, and others, I would say. Not, I mean, you know, only the list. Just, I mean, you know, I'm giving hints here. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> Adults, we know diabetic retinopathy now is spread and is effective and Sorry, uh, it has got a, a lot of uh, tension in the hospital and the community and affecting a lot of people. So we need I Amino mean, to uh, uh, know and address uh, the, the, how we can help those with the different types of treatment that is taking place. Age-related macular degeneration also uh, uh, obvious. It is uh, an area where I would expect low vision cataract and glaucoma, obvious, uh, another two and more uh, to be listed here, which I'm just uh, looking at it <coughs> quickly because the time. Here, the distribution of what is going on in the low vision and the percentage, and I would say here, if we count ourselves in the red area, we are 0.7. The highest is 1.4, and the lowest, 0.3%. Uh, so we would expect, I mean, you know, us to be uh, in the middle, if not beyond that, 
so we need, I mean, to prepare ourselves to deal with those conditions, okay? This is yeah, just repeating that, and I would say, if cataract is taking big junk or the, you know, the percentage of the situation, cataract operations now has improved a lot, and it's not like before the list, the waiting list is uh, that long. So I would say, I mean, you know, if it is 2010, now we are in a better uh, percentage. Clinical investigations, visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, visual field, color vision. Seven clinical gains would help clinicians to provide optimum treatment. That's acuity of less than 20, 40 in the better eye. Loss, uh, loss of contrast sensitivity, scotomas, visual field loss. Again, you need I mean, you know, to uh, assess this uh, 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 and use the appropriate tools, if you like. Accurately measure visual acuity. That is logmar charts to be used. And Snelly chart, counting fingers and hand movement are less accurate. So please, if there is any chance to avoid that, would be great. <clears throat> Reduce the testing distance by half and compensate the result by timing it uh, by, by two. <clears throat> Contrast sensitivity is an important test as patients need to differentiate between objects and surrounding. And if you have got the, uh, the measure of contrast sensitivity, that will help you in the management where you can be considered when advise a non-optical device like room decoration. Where is the door? Where is the whatever uh, the furniture? Refraction, accurate refraction is important and we shouldn't rely on the autorefractor. Okay, we go back to the basis and do retinoscopy is an important element in those patients and it will help. The, to uh, optimum visual performance, consider spectacle correction. And even sometimes those patients we will find more than one refraction. Okay, give the best refraction that will give the best visual acuity. <clears throat> uh, obvious visual field test, more useful in peripheral retinal diseases than central ones, formally if possible, and that's ancillary grade chart. This is detection and monitoring of age-related macular degeneration. And I do, we do advise even those uh, papers or those grids to be taken home and to be sick on the fridge. And the patient who is, has got age-related macular degeneration every day when he goes to the fridge to look there. And if there is any more distortion, it means that the dry has become wet, so need uh, medical attention. <coughs> uh, patient's education is very important. The expectation of the patient will be very high, but according to what the condition at that uh, time, we would expect, I mean, the, uh, the situation will not be promising. Therefore, vision loss is a challenging experience. Time should be given for the recommended device or devices relevant to the needs, hope, and inspiration factor to be considered. And that will take your time as a clinician. But again, you need I amino mean, to spare some time for your patient. <coughs> Networking, rehabilitation require multidisciplinary effort. It's not, I mean, you cannot say, I'm doing this and that's it. Okay, you have to uh, networking with ophthalmologist, optometrist, low vision practitioner, occupational health therapist, dispensing optician, health worker, social worker, family, family members, community, volunteers, okay, uh, also to be considered in your clinic. <coughs> vision rehabilitation are several uh, provided, uh, services provided by those who uh, are partially sighted and those who are blind. Though these services include mobility training, adaptive skills training, low vision instruction, career services training, psychological counseling, and others. And you can see, and it depends where you are. Okay, obvious, and what is available. But you know, if we uh, communicate and uh, get uh, what the others are doing together, 
we can make a difference to those patients. To take home optimum selection of patients, my profit from rehabilitation is a challenge supported by skill, upgrade, optimum clinical procedures and testing should be considered. Patients training should be given time and place. Collegiality is de dealing with low vision patient should be considered. And the sterile partnership should be considered. A lot of uh, companies and devices, yeah, new devices are there, but we are not aware of them. Then, you know, those people, they're supposed to be invited and they're supposed, I mean, to give workshops and we need, I mean, you know, to communicate with them to know what are the new devices so we can use them. Thank you. I'm not sure whether there's questions. Anybody has got question? If because of the time, I think we are running. Yeah, if you have got question, you have got those people who's going to be here, and you can, you know, in the coffee time, you can ask them, and uh, I'm sure, you know. <laughs> we are going to start we'll immediately. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. We are going to start the next session immediately, so if you want, you can join us, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Majdi. And who is going to stay here, he can get lunch. Who is not going to stay, he will be without lunch. Arrive, Dr. Ibrahim. Good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Katie. Okay. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm taking it all. Okay. <laughs>